We're entertaining emergency uh, dockets. We're hearing uh, civil and criminal matters. My chief judge there, Judge Bizzick, has done a fantastic job of taking the lead for us with um, communicating between the Supreme Court of Kentucky, uh, Justice Hughes, and for us as the orders have changed and, and morphed, uh, getting smaller and, and incorporating more things from day to day, seemingly almost. Um, Judge Bissick, I'm sure will tell more about our term meetings. We've met more than we ever had in the last several years lately, not in person. So things are going well and we're, we're getting by. We're looking forward to seeing everybody back in the courtroom, though. I can tell you that for sure. Um, I'll, I'll pop back in here. Judge Lindsay, how are things working in the federal courts? You're muted. I knew I would do that. There was a hundred percent. There was a one hundred percent chance I was going to forget to unmute myself. Uh, it, it certainly had a big, big impact on us, as as, as it has uh, with everybody. I echo what Judge Perry said. I, I hope that everybody is safe and healthy and taking this seriously and putting the uh, safety and health of themselves and their families and the rest of us first. Is certainly what we're trying to do. Uh, I, I think reduced to one sentence, I would say that uh, although the building is closed, our court is not and we are doing everything we can to do everything we can uh, without uh, bringing people in close proximity. Uh, for those of you who don't practice much or haven't practiced lately in federal court, it may surprise you that on the civil side, it really hasn't made all that much of a difference uh, because for decades, uh, depending, varying a little bit depending on the presiding judge, but for decades, we've done so much by phone. And so, uh, you know, when I'm focusing on my civil docket, I'm usually sitting at a round table on a, on a conference call. And if Judge Perry's going to show that uh, Air Force uh, coffee mug, I'm going to make sure I get this on the screen for a second. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's largely business as usual on, on the civil side, with the exception that I fielded a whole lot of phone calls and set up a whole lot of phone calls on my own initiative just to tell people, yeah, I hear you. I don't want you to do anything dangerous or unhealthy, but we can't just put the pencils down uh, until we get back to normal because we don't know when that's going to be. Uh, and so I've been encouraging people to do anything and everything they can remotely, including uh, using technology uh, like this. Uh, criminal side, uh, it's made a, a much bigger impact. Our, our criminal pre-trial proceedings, first of all, they dropped way off because of the arrests have dropped way off. Uh, we've done uh, initials, arraignments, detention hearings, and other preliminary matters uh, via uh, video. Uh, by law, we can't do that unless the defendant consents. Uh, and I don't love this, but all I can tell people, uh, a defendant, is, listen, you don't have to consent. You can insist on your right to have this in person. We'll be happy to do that. But I can't tell you when that's going to be. And the Speedy Trial Act is not, you know, the clock is not ticking until we have these initial appearances. So we have not yet had to do something. I'm not aware of anyone doing a change of plea, and certainly uh, no one has done a trial. Um, our general order, if you want to see the latest on what's going on, just go to the court's website. It's uh, general order number 9, 2020-9, will give you the specifics. Uh, Judge Caldwell in the Eastern District was midstream in a trial uh, that ended up taking eight weeks, and she went ahead and finished. And every, no one wanted to, no one wanted to stop. Uh, neither side in the case nor the jurors. Uh, Judge Caldwell arranged for medical grade uh, masks for the jury, and the jury uh, asked her unanimously to donate those to first responders. Uh, and they just sat far apart from each other and, and got through it. Um, Judge Bissig, what, what about from your perspective? How are things working for the uh, circuit? So I'm not sure of the people. I see there's about 250 people on this call if this is a balance or some civil practitioners, some criminal practitioners. I do want to say on behalf of all of us here in circuit court, uh, as Judge Perry said, we're meeting twice a week and we always think about all of our colleagues in the legal system. 
we know whether you're in a law firm and you're having to deal with cuts or just you're you know you're a parent and you're having to be home or you have a child that's graduating um it has been i would say we're starting about now and this week to get in some kind of new normal but i know it's been stressful for everybody and just want to echo judge Perry's comments that our thoughts are, are with all of you as you try to work through this situation none of us really could have imagined we would be in uh you know just a couple of months ago uh, just some global uh, directives about how we're working here in circuit court. When the first order came down issuing a slowdown of our state courts, we immediately went to work on the criminal justice side first. And I do want to give uh, a shout out to Justice Menton and Justice Lisa Beth Hughes because they have not sat on the sidelines and let us kind of struggle with what we're doing in court. They have been, as have been the attorneys with the administrative office of the courts, very engaged in how we kind of changed gears and pivoted quickly to do business. All of the circuit judges are covering a daily noon arraignment docket here in circuit court that covers all of our new criminal arraignments and bench warrants. Um, we each have a limited amount of criminal proceedings we can conduct because of our access to inmates in the jail. So we each have a one to three time slot every day Uh, I think Judge Bissig is having internet connectivity issues. Um, if, if anyone can see that, we have a question from the audience for her that I'll ask when she uh, comes back around. Um, Judge Ward, can I pass this along to you? I, I was very curious because to my mind, not, not practicing in family court, um, I've always thought of family court as being a place where in-person hearings are especially important. So how are things working in your courtroom? Am um, I gone? I hope I didn't. I hope I didn't miss oh. anything, but everybody did kind of freeze up for a minute. But I think that last question was directed at family court, and so um, hopefully uh, you all can hear me and uh, I'm not frozen up. But um, we have continued to have our. Uh, let's. I think we froze. That's what yeah, I'm trying to figure out. About. Am I frozen? Have y'all lost me? Yeah. We can hear you. Ah, oh, you're back. Okay. Back, back in. Everybody's been back in. Okay. We'll Welcome try again. back from the matrix. One thing I, one thing I've learned. Am I gone? No, we can see you. Okay. I was mid talking. Go ahead. I, I yes, I'm not sure here. One thing I've learned with all this is like we have to all be really patient, uh, because there's always like these little glitches and none of us are really experts on this. Um technology yet. I think we're all just kind of experimenting and uh, jumping right in. And um, so we just have to, yes, yeah, sometimes things happen. We, uh, in family court, we have we continued the first step uh, with the chief justice's order. We continued our domestic violence dockets uh, and we continued our emergency removals uh, in the, in the child abuse cases, the temporary removal hearings. Um, initially, uh, at first, you know, we were just like, in per, you know, everything's in person and uh, until we could figure out, get all the technology in place, figure those things out. Um, we now, I've had my domestic violence docket for the last three weeks, all via uh, Skype and um, almost 100% people are participating through that, through the Skype. We do have a couple of people that will come into the courtroom uh, here and there. On the temporary removal hearings, um, those we've had more people come in the courtroom because it's just there are so many players it's really hard and i think um some of the attorneys who are appointed to represent parents feel like they can't necessarily um do the best job representing that person unless they you know have a physical person-to-person -person contact and connection with them um so i, I think that's been the um the maybe resistance to getting everybody on the video technology for those hearings but we're we're continuing to push for that uh to get everybody on board with because we're we're as we as this goes along we add in more and we're trying to do more um it did kind of put our circuit dockets kind of at at uh standstill at first all of our divorce and custody stuff um, other than basically if you kind of made it known to the judge that you had an emergency situation, then on a judge by judge basis, people were addressing that. 
We now have a motion hour protocol um, in place. I think that's maybe been about the last three weeks uh, where we're doing an off docket motion hour. Um, what I understand is it may be more similar to what the federal judges have done all along. Um, from my standpoint, that's working well. I don't know how the attorneys feel about that. I know there's been some frustration because every judge has a little uh, different timeline on how they're doing the objections to those. Um, but that is avoiding having to have all those people in a courtroom. And obviously we just can't do that right now. So we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to keep everything moving forward. Uh, we're starting more this, um, maybe in the last two weeks of accommodating more hearings through Skype, even on the civil cases. So, but it's just kind of on a as needed basis. So, um, we're working in more and more, I guess, as we go along. Okay, um, thank you, Judge Ward. Uh, Judge Bissick, a couple questions came in for you in particular, um, but you did get caught off, kind of cut off midstream there earlier and wanted to make sure you you didn't have any points you wanted to address before we moved on. The only point I was going to make is for the civil practitioners on the uh, webinar today, the two ways, and Judge Perry, you can chime in, the two ways, if you have a case that you would like to either have a hearing scheduled um, or something that needs attention, um, we are all, uh, Judge Chavan is holding a telephonic motion hour. I think most of us are kind of triaging our motion hour as it comes in. In other words, if you notice a motion for a motion hour, um, we're reviewing those signing them when we can, something fairly perfunctory. If it isn't, we're having our staff contact you about a hearing. You can also jointly get with your opposing counsel. The Google Bar has done a good job of pushing out our staff's email addresses. If you email jointly our administrative assistant, they will also give you a hearing. We were waiting on those in the first couple of weeks, but I think now most of us are agreeing, per the Chief Justice's most recent order, we can hear as available non-emergent civil matters. So um, I would just recommend if you have something, a, a motion you'd like to be heard on or a discovery dispute you need to be heard on that you jointly contact the court staff to see about scheduling a hearing. Now, all of our hearings are being done either by Skype for Business or we have been doing them either through a call-in number or we call you. Uh, but we are here and available to hear uh, criminal things. Our first motion hour is scheduled right now to be June 1. Uh, and we're going to try to limit the numbers of people in the courtroom, separate the criminal from the civil motion hour, keep interested family and friends uh, from coming in so that we can practice social distancing in our courtroom. We're getting extra sheriffs to help social distance out in the corridor in front of the courtroom. But we do anticipate our first motion hour that's semi-regular being back on June 1. Um, we also um, are talking about slowly bringing back a grand jury and then how we're going to be able to bring back folks so we can hopefully by July start back jury trials. If you have something July or after, we're hoping we're going to be able to accommodate you. If you have something in June, we're going to put an emphasis on getting grand jury here in the state courthouse. So if you have a June jury trial, that will be rescheduled. Okay, so I, I am just getting a barrage of questions for all of you about uh, rescheduling trials and hearings and other proceedings that have been um, that have been stayed or postponed. And you, you've kind of addressed that partially, Judge Bissig, but in particular, people are asking, when are trials going to be, what uh, What are they going to look like when they come back, and how are things going to be rescheduled? I mean, are the March trials that come back going to be moved to April, or the April, you know, to be moved to June or July? Are we going to keep pushing everything back in order, or how's that going to work all of your courts? I, I can volunteer one answer to that question, and... Um, I think one answer to the question is we don't we don't know. Uh, you know we um, uh, we just got uh, a what's called a guidance memo from the uh, from the administrative office of the U.S. courts uh, on this issue of how do we go back to trials and so forth, when and how. Uh, but and I don't mean this critically at all. They're in the same boat we're all in. Uh, it's got a lot more questions in it than it does answers. Um, 
I'm attending a, a, a webinar tomorrow that's hosted by the Federal Judicial Center on this very topic. Uh, it, it'll be interesting. My, my, I suspect that I will again have more questions and answers coming out of that. Um, the, uh, the the when is hard to answer because the when of the pandemic is hard to answer. Therefore, the when of uh, the easing of social distancing uh, is up in the air. And uh, as to the how, I, I think this is uh, causing us, and I, I don't by us, I don't even mean the courts. It's causing all of us to think about things that we've never thought of before and fundamentally assess when and where and how we actually have to get together. So I used to be a real challenge and uh, uh, we have the, uh, uh, you know, you look at the federal courthouse and it seems giant, but you know, we don't occupy that much of the space. Logistically, I don't know how we would do it if, uh, if, if, if we were told uh, you have to you have to start that trial on Monday, but you got to do it with social distancing measures. Uh, it would be it'd be quite a challenge. So uh, I wish I could say more, but that's my working answer for now. Is I don't know, but a lot of people are thinking about it and working on it. The Chief Justice Minton um, has started a task force that's looking at uh, you know reading from places about uh, best strategies. We have already made a decision as a circuit term to stagger the bringing back of jurors so that we can try to social distance. Our court administrator is trying to order uh, masks for jurors that come in. We're trying to bring in a panel of 45 and keep them in our jury hold room here in state court, which normally can hold two to 300 people so that we can select that grand jury down in that big room where people can social distance We've talked about the grand jury deliberating up in the 10th floor, which is usually the Court of Appeals hearing room, to give them some space to spread out and cutting off time would send a feedback so that they can have private deliberations and then spreading them out through the courtroom when they come to give their daily report. That's a grand jury. So those are at least a window into the kinds of things we think we're going to have to start doing to get a pettit jury together whether it's gonna be small, like calling in a smaller additional uh, voir dire panel per jury trial so that the judge can go down and then we have to think about how to get on a court record, but spread those individuals out to conduct voir dire and then use each other's courtrooms for deliberation and probably only put two or three people in your actual jury box. And I'm pointing at my jury box right now and then spreading them out maybe on one side of the courtroom uh, and allowing a few people to come in, you know, maintaining social distancing. Those are the ideas we're discussing. Uh, but as Colin said, we haven't uh, we haven't finalized any of that. We have just gotten where we're trying. We've we've stopped trying to figure out exactly how we're going to conduct this business, and we've got business going on. And now we're turning our attention to how it's going to look when the slowdown order is lifted. But it isn't going to look exactly probably for a while the way it did, you know, pre-COVID-19 restrictions. We are trying because of those criminal defendants that are in custody to get an ability to hold a jury trial up and running as soon as we can safely do it. Um, like I said, it, we originally thought we were going to start June 1. That's now been pushed back minimally till July 1. And then it's going to be whether we can be crafty about using the spaces we have here in the building to be able to spread people out. It's probably going to mean to some extent limiting access to our courtrooms for people who are just interested just to keep the ability to social distance and other things like that that we don't like to do but that we may need to do. And Sam, I might add, the uh, all 13 of the circuit judges here are, are willing and able to talk to the lawyers uh, offline or on status conferences or on actual hearings. I encourage all of you out there listening. If you, I certainly know division three is if you want to talk about how this affects you directly, as long as both sides are willing to call in, we're anticipating that all of June, since we're not trying cases, we'll have tons of teleconferences and in-person conferences or simply just to chat about how this affects you and your case. So I would encourage you to contact the court, contact my staff, all the staffs. So I think they're going to be willing to entertain that and talk about how this affects you. We are all, in, we're expecting that, we're ready for it. And I for one encourage you to do it. Same here. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I had a couple more questions on these same topics. 
what uh, what role might technology play in allowing for social distancing for example might we web start with casting trials or hearings so people who need to know what's going on but don't need to be in the room can watch them um i know uh, you know if there are potential for example for for a trial to occur a, a bench trial to occur by a, a platform like this um is that being discussed and and if so what what are the judges thoughts on that I, I have a thought or two on that, Sam, if I can uh, volunteer to go first. Uh, I, I know there's there's been a lot of uh, discussion about Zoom and a lot of negative uh, focus on Zoom and their security uh, or lack thereof uh, in the minds of some people. I don't have the ability to uh, test that or understand it personally, uh, but we have a great IT staff. Uh, they're satisfied uh, that at least using the, a U.S. court uh, government account Zoom uh, platform uh, and with a, with a simple expedient of, of requiring a, a password uh, to participate in a Zoom call that the great number of the disruptive you know, Zoom bombing that was happening uh, has disappeared overnight. Uh, I have used uh, Zoom uh, successfully for confidential uh, uh, confidential proceedings like a, a settlement conference where uh, it's it's not only confidential as you know vis-a-vis -vis the public the vast majority of the discussion happens uh, just like it does in a mediation where one party and one lawyer are separate in, you know in, in a separate room having ex parte conversations with the mediator uh, I've had excellent success with it it works very well I've had uh, Court hearings with as many as 25 participants. Uh, it's again, it's worked well. Uh, and to kind of dovetail back to the other question, uh, that I think that you raised, Sam. I think what you were touching on, and I, I know Judge Bissick mentioned people who are just interested. Well, you know, Zoom can handle 500 participants. Uh, for now, I don't know if they're trying to upgrade that, but 500 people can log on. And so, what I've been doing. Uh, when I'm having a hearing on Zoom, I'm saying if the press or any member of the public wants to wants to observe, then they can contact my case manager and get the login information. I'm not going to put the login information on the record and inv invite some of the shenanigans that were happening, uh, but uh, we are, uh, you know, we had a, a, a hearing the other day in the Boy Scout uh, uh, Explorer cases, and we know people are interested in those, and people show up for those hearings, and so that's what triggered it, but I'm just going to be doing that going forward so that observers can observe. Uh, but, you know, we instruct them to mute themselves. The host can can mute anyone. So we just remind people uh, we're in court and you're sitting in the gallery. Uh, so listen and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. In family court, we're using, uh, I've, or I've used both Zoom and Skype. I feel um, from our IT people that either one is, um, uh, they are they are comfortable that those are secure enough for us to use those even on our confidential dockets. So if they're good with it, I'm good with it. And uh, um, so we've used both technologies. I think um, I think the judges are using, they really are very similar once you start to get used to them. Um, so you can kind of go between either one. They are. Just this morning, Sam, we, uh, we conducted the Veterans Treatment Court uh, like this, this exact same fashion. We had 18 people on the call, about 10 on the team, about five participants and a bunch of mentors. And it really works just like a court appearance. Uh, I stopped it, of course, and then when I ask people to speak, they speak directly to me. And then when their turn is over, it's over. And then you turn your attention to the next person, and it it worked great. So I would civil hearings in particular, uh, you you very quickly learn a code of uh, of conduct and kind of the rules of the road with Zoom. But uh, but that's it. Just speak and speak when you are asked to speak, and then move on to the next one. But it we've conducted. Um, treatment courts like that now for roughly three weeks and it works very well. So I think it will it will position and transition to civil hearings uh, quite nicely. 
Well, and to the extent the question also was looking at how we might use technology to ensure access to the courts, I know uh, myself and all my colleagues feel very strongly about the transparency of what we do here in our courtrooms. I think it's important that it be open to the public. I think it's important that there be access. Um, I know if there were media interest in a case that I had, I would certainly uh, allow in the courtroom even during these days at, so, at appropriate social distance. And I think um, the, the listener that asked the question is right. Um, obviously here in state court, you can go down to the second floor the day after any hearing and get a full copy of what happened. Uh, to the extent that people may want to watch real time, uh, we may look into what Judge Lynch was talking about, um, you know, having some kind of platform where you could view but not contribute um, to proceedings that are going on in court. And I'm a part of this uh, committee that's going to be looking at what we do as we open. And I think that's a point well taken uh, because I'm always sure to tell our jurors and our litigants that. You know, we, we are big here in the United States about our court proceedings being open and transparent, and nobody likes it when they feel like anything is going on behind those doors. Uh, so as we as we limit, you know, people for our health, we also are going to have to balance that with making sure that people feel like they know what's going on in these courtrooms. Um, and to the extent that these technologies can be used effectively to help that, I think we will. Thank you all. Um, another point, a, a related point that's coming up and that, that we wanted to address was, um, you know, what? how are we going to balance when people need to be showing up in court when we go back to some sort of at least partial operations? How are we going to balance um, high risk, people, you know, people with uh, pre-existing conditions that might make their, their health risk higher than the average? Um, are right, the questions that are coming in I think are really good. So for example, are they um are they gonna be compelled to sit on juries? You know, would that become a viable excuse for jury duty? Um in family court, Judge Ward, are 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 these sort of considerations starting to go into custody orders and determinations? Um you know, actually Judge Ward, if we could start with you and then I'll I'll pose the question to some others too. Sure. So, so we've kind of already had this in some ways because sometimes on um, like a domestic violence docket, one party might be able to appear in person, but the other um, maybe doesn't have access to a phone or what have you. So, so we've had, and I think what I would do moving forward um, also is just, so when, um, if, if I had a case where one party was not able to appear in person, I would allow the video technology to be um, still offered. I mean, I think, I think we're going to, we're going to probably continue to implement the video technology at least until we have a vaccine and can maybe be back to somewhat normal. But certainly if somebody had that, um, we're in a risk category, we we have the ability to um, have one party appear in person and the other appear through Skype uh, or Zoom. But and one of the things that we've had to do to try to facilitate that, though, is to have an extra laptop in the courtroom so that the person who's in the courtroom can also see what I'm seeing on my screen, uh, which is the, you know, the Skype conference and whoever's there. So we've we've already done a mix of that um, on, on several of our dockets where we have some people there and some people not. And we've already learned kind of the, the downfall of if you, the problem is if the person in person can't necessarily see the person that you're, that I'm confronting on the video. So that's where we brought in, we got this idea to have an extra laptop. I'll tell you, we don't have the, um, AOC is not providing extra laptops for that. So um, my, you know, we've we've all kind of figured out workarounds and we're, and I guess everybody is working on that. Um, I was able to buy a webcam just personally and I put that on my bench computer and now I use my laptop is gonna be set up at the conference table. Um, and then I had to get a one of these uh, HDMI cords from my husband because we don't have any extra ones around here. But we just kind of figured things out and have made do. Um, but that's uh, it, it's kind of cool to learn all the technology and figure it out and and be able to. The other thing is when you have a lap, extra laptop there on the counsel's table. And I guess for the private attorneys, if you all were the ones coming in, you could bring your laptop. You could connect into the system. Uh, that would probably help us out because not all the judges, I don't, you know, know if they have an extra laptop that they're accessing. 
but that also allows us to um, plug that laptop into the uh, jabs equipment that's there at council's table and if the then I can turn on my button that lets that be the recording and all of that gets into the record uh, which I can't do from the bench uh, just because that's not the way the recording equipment is set up um, so we're actually recording when we're I don't know about the the circuit judges but when we're when I'm recording uh, a, a Skype conference I'll turn my jabs equipment on in the courtroom so that I'm getting the audio recorded but to actually record what is what I'm seeing on my screen I have to record in Skype and then so basically I'm recording it separately. Um, so that's just one of those technology things we don't quite have figured out yet, but we've we figured out a way to do it. It's just not the, it's maybe not ideal. I've got an extra HDMI cord if anybody needs one. <laughs> that actually raises a, good, a, a really uh, important point, I suppose. If, if individual judges are bringing in their own technology to help facilitate this. Are there going to be efforts made on the administrative level to supply uniform technology to everyone and get all attorneys on the same on the same page with what's being used in every single courtroom? I know we're working with um, some outside foundations that may be able to donate or loan those to us. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen, but. Uh, I, I was told at AOC we don't we don't have the money for it, so we're going to have to be creative in how we figure that out. Well, and and one of the difficult things for the bar I know is that you know each judge runs their courtroom uh, somewhat differently, um, and it's hard to give a one size fits all answer for what's happening. I know our administrative office has put out um, weekly notices to train up the judges on Skype and on Zoom and using the various technologies. And I would say moving forward, if we're gonna have any specific kind of program and probably through the Bar Association and through our administrative office, I'm sure they would push out the lawyer to the lawyers what we're gonna be using. Um, but in, in some instances, like for example, in Division 8, I know Judge Chavan is using a call-in number where you call in and you Basically, it's like a virtual courtroom where you're waiting for the call of your case and you mute yourself, but you're listening to all the court proceedings. In my division, when I'm having hearings, depending on whether the lawyers want it to be Skype or telephonically, I initiate the call and bring in all the callers so that I'm in charge of, you know, who's in and who's out. And I do a separate either Skype or Zoom call for each case that I call on the docket. Um, I know again that, that each judge is handling their docket somewhat differently so i would do what what judge perry suggested and don't be shy about um you know jointly contacting the court staff uh telling them if, if you have a platform uh that you're comfortable with i'm happy to join in that i bring everything out here to my bench so i can record it through the jab system and like judge ward said we have on skype a way we can publish that uh, it gives you kind of two different formats for your record. Um, if we go to anything system-wide for the state courts, I would say definitely there would be some training for that. But what I envisioned is based upon experience is that we're each going to find our own workarounds and own systems. So depending on which of us you're in front of, uh, our staffs are not inundated, at least at this point, with contacts about uh, how to do things. And I've heard my secretary on the phone just asking people, can you do Skype? Can you do Zoom? The judge can call you, we can do it all telephonically, just trying to be flexible about how to get you in front of the court. Um, at first, I was having a hard time getting civil lawyers to take hearing dates. They all just kind of wanted to pass it to a time we could be back in person. More and more, I'm finding attorneys, as they get comfortable with this technology, accepting other ways to conduct our business. Mm -hmm. And Sam, I would encourage us to be optimistic. One of the things this moment in time has taught us is that we need more and better technology to both think differently and do things differently. Judge Bissick and I are both involved with uh, commissions and committees that go around the state. And several of those, at least all that I participate in, we've engaged uh, both Zoom and teleconferences and just a new way to think. And I think folks in Frankfurt, um, uh, I want to be applaud them and be optimistic that they're seeing that we need a real investment in technology of the courts of Kentucky 
statewide. And I think maybe for the first time in a long time, we're beginning to see why it's necessary in this particular moment. So I'm ever hopeful and really optimistic that this as much for now is going to be a good thing and a new way to do business uh, on lots and lots of levels. And, and again, I can't emphasize what just basic saying enough that all 13 and circuit judges are willing and able to entertain you on any platform you're willing to contact us on. We, we just are, and we will. We expect chaos and confusion to be sure, but that doesn't mean we can't do it. And we're just going to try hard to get it right. Uh, Judge Lindsay, what's what's the federal perspective on that? Is there more uniform technology available, or uh, or, or or is it still kind of um, ad hoc? Well, we we haven't yet developed uh, any uh, any kind of grand plan uh, for it. Uh, we we do have uh, you know a, a, the the luxury uh, of uh, a relatively small, much smaller, uh, relatively caseload to what the rest of the panel is dealing with. And we also have these, you know, habits ingrained in us and doing so much remotely already. Um, and, and when we do have a trial, other than the jury itself, uh, I, I think we could, we could accommodate without a great deal of change, uh, some uh, distancing within the courtroom. Uh, to me, I think the biggest, oh, and I'm sorry, you asked about the technology specifically. Uh, we have, you know, long invited people to lawyers. We, we, we offer up our IT staff to help lawyers uh, make sure that they're compatible with our system, that their equipment is, is compatible with ours. Uh, they know how our system works. And uh, the vast majority of lawyers who practice in our court uh, are familiar with, I still call it the Elmo. It's not, it hasn't been an Elmo for 20 years, but the, the modern version of an Elmo, uh, most attorneys uh, know how to use it. If you don't know how to use it, we will provide assistance directly from our IT staff uh, on those things. Uh, I think how to handle it. Where I was going uh, when I momentarily forgot your question is that, you know, for me, a jury is really going to be uh, the hardest thing. Uh, it, or the most uh, that will require uh, the greatest amount of the kind of flexibility that Judge Perry uh, very appropriately called for. Okay, and, and related to that, these technology issues, a really, really good question is um, preservation of record for appeal. If hearings are appearing over Skype and Zoom and this, this, uh, uh, technology where you can, for example, is either one of those um, or FaceTime or whatever. Um, are, is there a concern that maybe some of these uh, are being lost or might not be available for the record on appeal in the same way that a typical court record would? Um, and are, are this, what attention is being paid to that? So I don't think it's going to be a problem at all. Um, the only thing I would say is um, there may be some delay because like I know the first couple of Skype uh, hearings I, did, I haven't figured out how to uh, get it off of my PC or to teach my secretary how to do that to burn it. So just the accessibility, we may need a little more time to get it to you uh, it, here in this immediate time frame. But otherwise, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm still recording audio for sure in the courtroom. Um, so everything I know is at least captured in that way, even if there were, you know, like my PC, you know, exploded or something. But um, but otherwise, uh, I think we're, we're probably all taking the same precautions we always did to make sure that there is a, the record is preserved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know in every meeting I've attended, there's been an awareness that we need to have a record when we do a court process for for the appeals and for the litigants. And so that, that hasn't uh, been lost. And. As Judge Ward said, a lot of it may just be because a number of my hearings are telephonic. It may be voice only, where we're used to having, you know, the video and and all of that. Um, but we're aware, and and I, I don't I don't think any of us have had any proceedings where there hasn't been a record made. Sure, S Sam. What what we've been doing on that is uh, just having a court reporter. Uh, working from home, uh, connecting to Zoom uh, as a participant. Uh, 
I try to remember to do this in all my court proceedings, uh, but I've de it's definitely been at the front of my mind in these Zoom calls to tell people it's critical that we have a clean record. Mute yourself when you're not talking. Uh, don't interrupt. Uh, Zoom has a, a hand raise feature. If, if someone physically puts a paw up, uh, number one, I can see that it's the host. Number two, a little green hand appears uh, on that person's screen to alert me that someone's got a question. I find that a little spooky, but it works. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's it's it just it's just an extra challenge, uh, but that that that's how we've been slicing it. And for the bars, uh, notice and edification. Skype for business has a built-in record feature that merges both video and the audio. It takes it a, a few moments, if a couple of minutes, to merge it once you're done, but it'll record that proceeding, whatever it was, directly onto your machine. You can retrieve that and then make that the record itself. And of course, uh, if you can imagine, all of us uh, here in the Judicial Center, we usually sit with the red light on and our phone or our computer uh, right beside the mic. So it's recording everything. Thank you. Um, related to that issue of preservation of records for appeal, I also had a question about what it's particularly in the circuit courts. Somebody's got an appeal deadline like next week and they need to come to the circuit court clerk's office and get the physical paper record. Or how, how is that being handled? If at all. The, the clerk's office is open and running on a staggered schedule. So uh, the, the clerk's office is open for business. Uh, David Nicholson did a good job. There are little bins at the doors of the courthouse where if you don't want to come in here, you can file meetings and stay outside. But they are here in terms of requesting record, um, as you always have. Uh, they're here. They're on a, a split staff. They have an A team and a B team, uh, and they only come to work every other day so that they don't cross pollinate. So you may have to be a little more patient uh, with them, but they're here and processing cases and the clerk's office is open. In terms of deadlines, um, the Supreme Court did not issue, some, some states there has been kind of a blanket extension of all civil deadlines uh, in cases because of the COVID-19 virus. Our Supreme Court, because the clerk's office is open, uh, told us that they weren't going to issue a blanket extension. Now, the judicial budget bill did include a statute of limitations uh, point in it. So by statute, uh, there will be an extension of some of the statute of limitations. But in terms of general civil rules that you're operating under, um, it's going to be a lot into the you know discretion of the judges. I will say that I think, and Judge Perry, you can join in, that most of the judges will find uh, that this COVID crisis represents good cause for some kind of reasonable delay. Um, sure. Obviously, there are always other things and we have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. But the email we received from the Kentucky Supreme Court said they weren't going to do blanket civil extensions, but they were going to lean on us to use our discretion in those cases. And Judge Perry, I don't know if you want to add to that. That's my understanding yeah. of the situation. Uh I completely agree. I think everybody's open-minded and willing to be extremely flexible, certainly in the next month to six weeks to two months for sure, when we really have to pay attention to, to the time and timing of the things that uh, that are necessary. The biggest takeaway from all this, as Chief Bitsig is telling you, the courts are open. The courts of Kentucky are open, and we're just trying to find a new way to do business. Okay, and uh, one more kind of procedural question, I, and I apologize, I'm not even going to be able to get close to everybody's questions, um, but one question I thought was worth asking, what, is, is there any process or, or procedure in place for, for litigants or attorneys who might object to certain virtual appearances as inadequate? For, for their purposes. And you can imagine a lot of different circumstances where that kind of objection might come up. Sure. Well, I, at least in Division Three, Sam, and for those, and I think this would be consistent with most of the term, is that if somebody doesn't want to do it, we're not going to make them do it. The courts of Kentucky will be open to in-person. We're expecting 
uh, on June the 1st. And we'll just have to find a way to wait until early to meet to mid-June to have people in the courtroom safely and so they can voice whatever objection they want to make on their traditional record. But uh, again, so what is today, the 28th? We're still, I say we're six weeks away, but on the other hand, we're only six weeks away. We're going to be back uh, hopefully in something that looks like normal operations fairly soon. So at least for me, if somebody did not want to do it, I would not make them do it. We would, But the only alternative, it, it seems, is simply to wait until we can get back into the courthouse. So it would have to be unanimous, case by case. But again, that's why I would encourage everybody to call us, contact us, and, and have that conversation. What do they want to do that's specific to their particular uh, matter before the court would be my suggestion. I would have a, a slightly different answer to that uh, question in terms of how I'm handling things, at least. Certainly anything that takes on a constitutional, it has a constitutional dimension to it, uh, confrontation, the right of confrontation in, in a criminal case, uh, those aren't things that can be, you know, compromised away. Uh, and so I would agree with you largely, uh, Mitch, on that front. On, on the civil side, uh, I'm being a little less flexible uh, than what you've suggested. And I've had a couple of people, uh, a couple of, well, quite a, quite a handful actually of cases in which the lawyers have proposed, let's just stay everything for two months. And so we can get, you know, so we can do this normally when we get back to normal. And I have been, I have done that in a couple of cases in which there were some exceptional circumstances. Uh, we had a, uh, I had a lawyer who was in a couple of high risk categories and whose client was, you know, as, as a frontline, uh, you know, it's a healthcare company. Uh, in that one, I, it, I was more flexible than I am with a lawyer who said, uh, I really like to be there in person for my expert's deposition. To him, I said, yeah, I get it. Uh, I wanted to also when I was in your shoes, but we didn't have COVID when I was in your shoes. So you're taking it, you're taking it remotely. Uh, so, uh, but the, the other thing you said, Mitch, that I, that I would echo is, you know, it, it's, you know, it depends on the circumstances. It's case by case, it's judge by judge. And uh, I, I think any, any of our judges would uh, welcome uh, a request for a status conference with any of our magistrate judges or district judges uh, to, to simply ask this question, hey, we have X coming up, uh, how, how should we do this? With the family court, um, definitely it's had to be a case by case basis because, you know, if it's a situation where one parent is withholding a visitation uh, to the other parent, that may be something that I just feel like I, I have to kind of force their hand, like, no, we're going to deal with this. So uh, if you need to log in on the phone, log in on the phone. But nobody can really say, you know, no attorney can say they can't get on the phone. But uh, obviously it's it's ideal and preferable if everybody's in agreement, because I, I don't want to set up any issues for appeal or uh, to somebody say they didn't have a fair a trial or hearing, but um, but I have I have uh, I can think of at least one case where I said no, we're we're going to have this hearing, so get on board. Um, thank you all. So, entering the kind of lightning round of this presentation, um, I wanted to ask uh, you know as I was looking around at how other courts have been doing this, I um, I noted that in Broward County, Florida. The, uh, the judges there have seen fit to issue an order remarking that they've seen attorneys appearing clearly in bed or shirtless by school uh, or in court for, for hearings um, and asking that the police not do that and act like they're in court. And I was wondering if you uh, four had any suggestions, obviously, you know, wear a shirt to your hearing. Beyond that, are there particular best practices for attorneys in terms of dress code, location, appearance, um, whatever that they should observe in these kind of virtual hearings? I'll, I'll start on that one. That's a great question. I have had to call uh, two dogs out of order during hearings. <laughs> it's been kind of funny, you know, because people are working from home and lawyers are being serious and representing their clients and then a dog will see a bird out the window and start barking. 
usually rule them immediately out of order and we all have a good laugh. Um, I can fortunately say I have not, uh, Mr. Wardle, had anyone show up at a hearing in pajamas or in bed. Uh, I did have a lawyer that was on a conference call I held in a case kind of go dark for a minute and came back and he had a tie on and he didn't have a tie on before and the other lawyers did. So you want to keep in mind that you, you know, you're, you're physically on a record. Um, but I, you know, our law, our bar, the caliber here, I think is so good. And, and everyone has been very professional. I will say the one thing that I, I have had happen that I would advise against, I had a, a, a telephonic hearing that I think had upwards of 25 people on it in a case. And it is helpful, you, you get eager to make your point because lawyers are excellent advocates and you jump in. It's helpful if you're on a multi-party phone call that you announce who you are each time before you speak. Um, I also just had a hearing yesterday morning where a couple of the lawyers were interrupting each other. Um, and that's understandable. Again, I, I understand why it happens, but it, particularly when you don't have the benefit of being in a, in a courtroom where you're at opposite tables and you can see where it's coming from, you know, the getting eager to make your point or the not wanting to sit by while you think something that's wrong is being said, to, to try to make your notes on a legal pad. I, I generally, uh, my staff tells me, tend to let people go back and forth and back and forth too much because I don't ever want people leaving the courtroom thinking they didn't get heard on a specific point. But to that, I think as we go through these technologies, just you know, the basic talk one at a time uh, is really important and it sounds basic, but when you get in a hearing and, and you know, you're, you're either antagonized by something that was said or affronted because you don't think it's accurate or you just have a, an eager argument to make. Um, I haven't had a problem with, with wardrobe malfunctions or any other issue, but the, the one I would say that's, that's a frequently occurring one is just interrupting each other. Um, so that would be my only two cents on that. Yeah, I've learned that um, it's interesting as the judge when you're the host of the, of the meeting, the Skype or whatever. So I, pretty early on, I learned that I can mute everybody. And so I thought that's a nice tool to have in your tool belt. It's like, hey guys, I just muted all of y'all. So nobody can hear anybody but me. So, uh, but it, it's interesting because as a judge, all of a sudden you're, you're now the bailiff too, like you're, you're running everything. You're the technology person. You're the judge. You're the bailiff. Uh, it's a little exhausting, but um, I haven't had any problems with attorneys. They've been very uh, professional. And um, one thing I would tell all the attorneys, because I think some some that have got on that maybe are newer to the technology were like kind of maybe nervous or you know like oh you know frustrated because their their sound wasn't working. But I, I want all of the all of the folks to know like none of us are experts in this stuff yet. So we're all still learning. And I think every judge is going to be as patient with you as uh, as you are, if you please be that so with us, because um, uh, we fig we we do figure these things out. I had one where we could not get the attorney's sound to work for some reason, but there's always the phone option. So he was appearing on the video, but we had him on the actual landline phone. So you know, there's there are workarounds. So don't panic, be patient, and. Um, I appreciate everybody's professionalism. The the pro se litigants have been interesting, and I had uh, I did have one pro se uh, litigant that she you know she was. It's so funny because they're they're at home and it's it's just very intimate with these folks. But she's at home with her hair rollers in and she's smoking her cigarette, and I'm like, this is just so weird. <laughs> I, I wanted to tell her to put her cigarette out, but I didn't. I just let her smoke her cigarette. So. Sam, what, what I've been doing, uh, especially in settlement conferences, because they, they the, the, the shortest one takes several hours and some of them, you know, last, you know, eight or nine hours and sometimes even longer. Uh, so what I've been telling people or trying to remember to tell people and I'm actually putting it in my order uh, for this, when I'm setting a settlement conference via Zoom, I'm saying, number one, you know, please be you know, present uh, uh, in, in more than just in body, you know, please make whatever accommodations you can so that you can focus on this and, you know, dress and conduct yourself like you would as if you were in the courthouse. But uh, as I've uh, taken to uh, phrasing it, life happens on Zoom. And so 
if your dog walks through the door uh, through the room or you got to get up and change a diaper or whatever it is it's fine we'll get through it you know we're, we're uh, you you can't when 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 people are suddenly uh homeschooling and or taking care uh, of an elderly relative uh you know you can't just say oh that's also well and good but this is you know, so I've just tried to expressly say to people, we're, we're going to have some flexibility. Um, a tiny little detail that's helpful on this is if you instruct people to identify themselves uh, when they log in to whatever program you're using, have your screen name be your actual name and, and who you are in the case. Uh, you know, it doesn't do me any good to see, you know, Jimmy Loves Motorcycles 22 on, on somebody's screen name. Uh, you know, I want to see you know, Mitch Perry, counsel for defendant, you know, Angela Bizzik, uh, corporate representative. Uh, so that that's, it's a little detail, but it's very helpful. And I don't know if anybody can hear my dog's drinking right now, but that's what that's saying. <laughs> Where's my gavel? Got my gavel, ready. Um, hey, so the LBA has requested, uh, I'm gonna pop off for just a second before I, I uh, lead it out, but has requested that we get a they could get a screenshot of all four of you smiling for the uh, for the website. Can I can I say before we sign off, Sam? Since we have it looks about like 250 people, please make Absolutely. sure since you're all members of the justice system that people know that the domestic violence intake center is open and that the family court judges are hearing emergency protective order cases. Um, you know, at a time people are locked down at home, I think it's part of all of our responsibility to make sure that the impression isn't that those those matters aren't being addressed. Police are making calls on those kind of cases. And just because we're all representatives of the legal system, just to make sure that's known everywhere you go, that those cases in particular are up and running. Thank you, Judge Bissick. And I object to being in the picture, but I'll deal with it. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for being a part of this. This has been extraordinarily enlightening and helpful and i and i'm sure everybody who who watched got a lot out of it for those viewing um this, a recording of this will be available on the website also if you have questions specific to the appellate courts next week we will also be hosting a program with uh with another very distinguished panel of judges and the uh, lba should be sending out promotional stuff on that shortly um thank you all and and uh genuinely appreciate it and best of luck as we hopefully get back to normal thanks sam yeah. thank you sam thank you all thank you all